Well, and something I thought about the, is that, you know, you had done, uh, it was a collaborative interview you did with uh, Dan Hunt um, and the late Michael Brooks. Uh, you had interviewed Lula da Silva. Uh, this was, of course, after he had been released from prison. Um, I think this was a little over a year ago at this point. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, was it, I thought it was a great interview. And something that Lula said was, you know, he really got to the fucking point, which was, you know, under Bolsonaro, we have, like, gone back to basically a form like being a colonial subject i don't know exactly how he said it but like through this sort of neoliberal uh economic restructuring programs that he has uh you know austerity measures and all the things that he has done as president it's like the united states has a fuller grasp over the brazilian society and economy and that has basically subjected brazil back into this kind of colonial subject position so I want to, you know, this is what your documentary that you co-produce also addresses is the neoliberal economic policies under Bolsonaro. Um, but to me, when I think of neoliberalism, I think of, at least in the context of the relationship between, say, Brazil and the United States or other uh, uh, northern countries, is that it's really a relationship that's been going on for a very, very long time, um, where, you know, Brazil asserting any sort of autonomy or sovereignty economically or politically in the world is seen as a threat to U.S. hegemony. Um, and uh, and that neoliberalism, at least in the context of Brazil, is a way for U.S. corporations and banks and the U.S. political system at large to just continue to exploit and plunder the resources of this country at the expense of not letting the Brazilian people have access to these resources themselves and benefiting from them. So, would you find that the neoliberal, uh, the neoliberal restructuring, if you want to call it that, of the Brazilian economy, is a really just a form of neo-colonialism? Yeah, it definitely is. That's what it's. It's used as an excuse to exercise neo-colonialism. Definitely, uh, remembering that like neo-colonialism was pretty much invented in Brazil by the British and then in the 1800s. Like Brazil was the first mm. big country that they decided instead of invading. Let's just try and take over their economy. And so they, you yeah. know, um, <clears throat> but definitely, definitely. And, um, you know, like every time Brazil has ever had a president that's tried to exercise sovereignty, there's been a coup or a coup attempt, starting with Getulio Vargas. Now, there was a he committed suicide during a coup attempt in 1952 or 1953 in which U.S. companies like Chevron were trying to privatize the newly created, they were trying to cancel his creation of a new state petroleum company, Petrobras, which was the reason why the U.S. got involved in the coup against Dilma Rousseff as well. You know, like uh, the a few months after Brazil discovered these massive offshore petroleum reserves called the pre-salt, in the pre-salt uh, layer offshore, which would, you know, if they're exploited, would propel Brazil into being one of the top five petroleum producers in the world. A few months later, the U.S. reestablished Southcom, the Southern Command of the Navy, uh, that had been disbanded after World War II. <laughs> you know, and mm -hmm. we now know Dilma Rousseff has even talked about it. Uh, I bring this up because in Vincent Bevan's book. He mentions a hallway conversation he had with Dilma the day she was finally impeached, in which she said off the cuff that she didn't think the U.S. was involved in her mm -hmm. uh, the coup against her. But now she said that since subsequently said that in many interviews. So I found it odd that he would say that in the introduction of his book. But right. but we know that uh, the you know the the one of the if if you're gonna analyze a coup, right? You have to follow the money. Who benefited the most? And if you look at one of the first actions after the coup in 2016 was that Michel Temer, first of all, he canceled Dilma Rousseff's decree uh, earmarking all profits from petroleum, uh, from Petrobras Petroleum Company to the public health and education systems. He canceled that. And then he immediately began selling off oil reserves at below market rate greatly below market rate to uh, the big petroleum multinationals, many of which are from the United States, like ExxonMobil and Chevron, 
The third big petroleum multinational that benefited a lot was um, Shell, you know. But I, you know, I feel like Shell is not American, but it's part of this imperialist project, you know. Sure. So, and then, yeah. I mean, you can look sector by sector, all of these American companies that benefited, like Cargill, for example, Monsanto, uh, Shell, which is British, Dutch, whatever, Shell, Chevron, Exxon. What I mean, even little things like one thing Lula did after he was elected was that he. Um, he issued an order transforming the federal government's computer networks over to Linux. And so one of the first mm. things that Michelle Temer did was he canceled that and brought back Microsoft and sent, you know, $230 million to Microsoft to transform the entire federal government system back to, to its project. Wow. So, I mean, U S corporations just benefited so much from this process. It's ridiculous to act like it was just something that happened accidentally. And, you know, the, the, mm-hmm. If you, there are people who say like if you talk about U.S. influence in the coup, you're denying brilliant Brazilians agency, even though Franz Fanon in the 1950s very clearly defined the, these types of people in developing world business communities as uh, the uh, comprador bourgeoisie who make money off of turning over natural resources to the U S or in the case of Africa, you know, France or mm-hmm. England or whatever. So I don't know. I'm on a tangent now, but <laughs> basically I just want to always emphasize when I talk about this stuff, always emphasize the U S role because it's something sure. that's just been like censored by a mission in the, in the American media for, from, yeah. from 2016 forwards, really. Okay. Yeah. Well, I have one more question. How much time do you have left? Whatever, it's okay. I'm, okay, you're good. I'm okay, just in cool. quarantine mode, you know. So. <laughs> All right. Okay. Good. All right. Um, okay, so we have a presidential election in Brazil coming up next year, 2022. Uh, of course, I imagine Bolsonaro is going to run as he would. Um, and you mentioned some of the things involving Lula. I know in previous interviews we have discussed that whole situation you went more in depth into the lava jato uh fiasco or investigation um but since then we know lula was not only released from prison due to some leaks that came out showing exactly what was going on with that investigation how it was there to frame him and other members of the pt party such as uh president Rousseff. um but really this was just a way to get him out of the presidential election in 2018 because apparently, this is something that's interesting to me, at least. He served two terms as president. It's similar to the United States where you can serve, you know, two four-year terms as president. But because there was, a, I guess, a term he didn't serve, you know, he then, you know, uh, uh, Rousseff then became president after him. He then could run for president again, correct? Yeah, just the, like the U.S. Who was it in the U.S. who like, did that? It wasn't Grover yeah. Cleveland, was it? I can't Of uh, uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt. No, no, I not think. Roosevelt. Or, Oh. Served five consecutive terms, but there was a president right. in the 1800s who was like elected, lost right. re-election, came back later and got elected again. I think it was yeah, might have been Cleveland. Have, I don't know. Might have been. I can't remember. But um, so he so he wanted to run again because of what happened in uh, with yeah. the uh, impeachment because, of because the um the the coup against Dilma Rousseff was undoing everything that they they'd done. Yeah. The PT party had right. done, so he was trying to. He was running for re-election. Sure, yeah, it makes sense. I understand that. Um, so this again, he was thrown in prison. Information came out showing what was really going on there. He was released, and then just very recently, I guess all the charges against him have been removed. Dropped. I guess there was a reversed. Dropped. Yeah, reversed. Reversed. So that means he can run mm-hmm. next year for president. Is that his political okay. rights restored? And they're misreporting it in the Anglo media I saw on CNN mm. and everything. They're acting like it was just a technicality and that the Supreme Court is just transferring the investigations to another court. And that's not the case. Oh, well, what's okay. happened is all charges were thrown out because of illegal forum shopping. They transferred the case to a state and a city that had no relationship whatsoever to the crime. Because that local public prosecutor's office was already working in partnership with the U.S. Department of Justice. And the judge was working in partnership with 
U.S. DOJ and the FBI, we now know from the leaks, too. And so it was illegally forum shopped. That means that every single charge and every decision made by the judge was rendered um, illegal. And so the Supreme Court ruled that if another judge or another prosecutor's team would like to start from scratch a new corruption investigation against Lula, um, they could do it in the Brasilia district. You know, yeah. related to these charges of reverse and stuff like that. But the problem is, I spent an hour on the phone with Lula's defense lawyer yesterday or the day before yesterday, you know, just chatting about random stuff because we, I did a little work for them and we're, you know, she's really cool. That's all I want to say. I got her on the Michael Brooks yeah. show once too. And she was okay. on Democracy Now! this week. And we were just talking okay. and she said like, one of the things is that because Sergio Moore was bizarrely allowed to rule over the investigation and then judge the case that he judged the investigation of in a, you know, with no jury, this means that all of the evidence that he rejected in the pre-trial period, in the investigation period, and in the trial would have to be reanalyzed and ruled on admissibility or not. So just in this case with a triplex apartment in Lula, right? the one that resulted in him going to jail for like 582 days or something like that. Mm -hmm. Before the trial even began, Sergio Moore rejected every single defense witness. He rejected testimony from 73 defense witnesses who were all saying like Lula never owned the apartment. He never went to the apartment. We know this now. He never owned the apartment. I mean, that's so in order to open up a new investigation into Lula, it would take so much time to judge and rule on all of the evidence and stuff like that, that there's no way that they could get a conviction by next year's election season. It would just be impossible. They'd have to like vastly break all Brazilian records. And the fact is that the, the Intercept released a tiny portion of a very tiny portion of the leaked telegram conversations. The hacker, Wagner Delgatti, gave um, Glenn Greenwald 57 gigabytes of conversations and then asked if he wanted more. And he said, no, he didn't want any more because they already had enough to do a bunch of articles about it. And of that 57 giga, Delgatti is complaining that they, they only released very selective things. So once the, the Supreme Court handed over the six terabytes of conversations to Lula's defense team, all of these bombs started dropping. Like on the day Lula was imprisoned, the Lava Jato task force leader called it a gift from the CIA, <laughs> you know, and things like this. Mm -hmm. um, wow. And so there's, and the stuff that's been released since the defense team got it uh, in the, in the course of like filing all these motions to dismiss with evidence and this and that um, it's implicated like three Supreme court justices in illegal collaboration with the Lava Jato Task Force. So basically, I think there's no political will to reopen a case against Lula because it would open this huge can of worms now that would implicate sectors of the judiciary and other very powerful people in, in Brazilian political life. So that the idea that's being spread around, I'm sorry, this is a long answer because lawfare okay. is deliberately made as complicated as possible so that journalists can't explain it in the limited amount of space they have, and they end up just repeating allegations made by the prosecutors, for the most part, like the Guardian did for years with Lava Jato and New York Times. But anyway, what this means is that uh, it would be almost, at this point, almost impossible for Lula to have his political rights taken away from him before next year's election. And he's currently polling 13 percentage points ahead of the nearest competitor, who is Bolsonaro. And also of the 10 possible candidates that were polled for next year's election, he has the lowest rejection rating, which is yeah. something else that's been misreported. Some reporters are saying, oh, he has a high rejection rating. Well, you could say it's high, but it's the lowest one, <laughs> you know? So, yeah. yeah. And it's under, you know, it's under yeah. 50%, so 44%, right. so okay. probably lower than... Um, Biden's or Trump's rejection ratings in the last U.S. election. So yeah. that's a long, you know, long answer, whatever. I could go off on this lawfare stuff all day right. long. There's but... so many, 
it's a it's an unfolding thing too it's just like so much has just come out in the past year just one like bit after another and like you said you know bombs are dropping more information comes out so this is something and this may sound a bit paranoid on my part but i do want to address this because um i don't think we should take lightly the fact that bolsonaro is who he is what his family is you know as we mentioned the very very beginning of this his son eduardo was in washington dc with that so-called war council with other very close uh, allies of Trump, which of course it's it's at least believed, rightfully so, that they were very aware of what could or would happen the next day on the sixth, in which thousands of people stormed the Capitol building. I personally think it could have been a lot messier and worse, it, it, just due to the circumstances what we now know. Um, so you have again a very close member, <laughs> I mean, of his son, a lawmaker in D.C with these people so i'm curious this cross-pollination or this overlap between uh, like what how bolsonaro is like not only addressing the pandemic and other things um to with trump with this election coming up next year i mean i'm curious what your thoughts are about what potentially could happen if you have someone like lula coming up like hey like i lula could very well win and it would be, I think, a very positive thing for, for Brazil for that to happen. But I think Bolsonaro, I, I don't see him just accepting the results of the election. I don't see him doing anything gracefully in that regard. So, I mean, what is your sense of that? I mean, obviously, it's a little far out from now to be making predictions or anything. But what are your concerns or ideas about that? Well, one of the main differences between Bolsonaro and Trump is that Bolsonaro has large sectors of the military on his side. Brazil gave amnesty mm-hmm. to all of the dictatorship actors, and a lot of the key figures from the dictatorship are now in Bolsonaro's government, like General Augusto Heleno, who was the architect of the Sit Soleil massacre in Haiti, in Porta Prince during the Minusta occupation. Who has been um, that minister occupation has been misrepresented by a handful of Aristide fanatics in the social media this in this last week? It's a can of worms, but it's important to know that Lula removed Heleno from Porta Prince seven days after the um, massacre. He didn't have the power to fire him outright, but they kind of pushed him into early retirement after transferring him to a much less prestigious job. And Heleno has been a mortal enemy of Bolsonaro, of of Lula ever since. Mm. And he's now in charge of 17 government agencies, including intelligence. Um, He's the chief of institutional security and probably the most powerful person in the Bolsonaro government. And so the military is now running 17 ministries for Bolsonaro. And there's thousands of former or current military officers in his government. There's actually more military in the Brazilian government now than there was during the last 10 years of the military dictatorship, which is absurd. Mm, you know, so the, the question is really this. Uh, we didn't, the, the results of a free and fair election in 2014 were not respected. Uh, the, the opposition immediately froze the government and threw out Dilma Rousseff illegally on a technicality. And then the 2018 election was not free and fair because we now know that completely illegally, based on frivolous charges and an exception to the Constitution opened up by the Supreme Court, essentially a state of exception ruling, reminiscent of Hitler years or whatever that Carl Schmitt used to write about, uh, that election wasn't free and fair. And not only was the leading candidate removed, um, but his replacement was illegally smeared in the media by Sergio Moro, who leaked, he violated Brazilian election law by leaking incriminating plea bargain testimony uh, against Fernando Haddad that uh, insinuated that he was involved in some kind of corruption the week before the elections. And then after the elections, it came out that that plea bargain testimony had already been thrown out by the courts for being nonsense. 
and there was no mm-hmm. charges ever raised against Haddad. So that election wasn't free and fair. So um, I'll just say one of my one of the characteristics of the Brazilian Workers Party is that they've invested really heavily in the rule of law. A lot of the founders of the party were former armed guerrillas who fought, you know, uh, who kidnapped uh, ambassadors and things like that during the dictatorship, who fought against the dictatorship. And so when they decided to start this political party, they, they were like, we want to fight as hard as we can to uphold the rule of law. So all of the PT's chips are in this idea that there's going to be fair elections next year. And I personally mm-hmm. am a little bit worried viewing, living down here and seeing what's been happening for the last couple of years. I'm, as you mentioned, I'm a little bit worried that they aren't going to be that free and fair. And, um, you know, him, Bolsonaro calling on his followers for a Trump style storming of the Capitol. That's like the least of the worries, because unlike Trump, I mean, we see it looks like the big machine of intelligence and military and stuff was on the side of upholding the rule of law. Trump managed to corrupt the Capitol police who collaborated Mm -hmm. in this. But in the case of Bolsonaro, he's got like the Army, Navy and Air Force on his side. And so in and some people in the army command are beginning to break with Bolsonaro and things like that. But none of them are saying like we would endorse workers party. Like one of the most powerful generals, Santa Cruz this week, he's saying, well, we can't have Bolsonaro reelected, but we can't have Lula reelected either because they're both extremists, which is BS because Lula's like a, a social Democrat. He's not a communist yeah. or anything. Yeah. Um, anyway, that's a short answer. This could go on. Sure. There's legitimate concerns. Is yeah. Oh yeah. All right. So, you could just edit out that last part and just say there are legitimate concerns. <laughs> you just want to no, reduce no, no, this no, to like no. a two-minute soundbite yeah. news story. No, 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 no. 